Thanks, Randall. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thanks, thanks for coming. Um, oh, I would like to have, have this, con this more kind of conversation than presentation, so feel free to ask questions when you see some topic that you want to know more about or if you don't understand or you want more details about, okay? Um, please feel free to do that. Um, well, the reason why we are here is probably is, uh, is well, very well known. Uh, seed is one of the most important things, uh, uh, or the more re one of the more most relevant factors that we impact, impact your yields. Um, there's a lot of factors that uh, uh, can impact your yield in a positive and negative way. Of course, that starting with a good quality seed is is is, a, is, is the right is the, is the right way to go. Um, another very important piece is that. Uh, you guys know that the seed potatoes are the highest value potatoes that you have in your farm. Not only because of the cost of the seed, but because all the added cost that you have after that, you need to transport, hand, handle that, cut, treat the seed after that. You need to store when you're pre-cutting and uh, to, to get to the, to the field. So that's a one, probably one of the, if not the most uh, impactful uh, cost item in your cost of production is one of the most uh, expensive ones. Um, and these three items that I have about cut seed, uh, very applicable, especially for Canada, United States, that because we have as part of our production system, uh, we do cut seed, right? So when we do that, is basically uh, we turn one uh, product, a finished product that is wrapped in the right envelope or right package. That's the tuber with the skin. We cut, basically, we, uh, I don't know if it was, it was you, Rick, that was telling me about, is that, it's like you, oh, uh, Steve was talking about that yesterday. It's like you cut your arm, basically, and, uh, and uh, still thinking that the body will be functioning in a normal way, when actually the body is trying to heal, but putting all the energy to try to heal, basically, the wound that you have, and still perform. Right? Yeah, that was Steve. That was Steve, right? <laughs> yeah. So that's basically what we do. Every single time that we cut seed, that's basically we are causing. So if you're thinking about a, a tuber like a, a live organism, which it is, so basically what this this is basically what we are doing. You are cutting this the, the, the seed in a half or in multiple pieces, uh, and uh, still uh, expecting that to perform as a regular seed, whole seed. Okay. So of course that there's some implications, and the Rick will, will talk more about that on the on the disease point of view. But of course that when you do that, uh, you increase the risk of your crop because uh, every, the, 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 the the cut the cutting process per se is a, is a bruise that needs to be healed, and then after that you need to store. After that you need to plant, right? So it's a very delicate product that uh, you we are regenerating, let's say. Okay, a cut seed is the most, is, and because of that is a very challenging. Uh, potato to store, right? We require very specific conditions, aeration, <coughs> temperature, relative humidity, and you still have risk of losses because if you don't manage properly, uh, your aeration, too much, shrinkage. Uh, not enough, you start to have losses uh, because the, the potatoes start to rot, right? Um, and there's implication on the disease that we, should, uh, that we could be talking about. And of course, that when you cut the seed, uh, automatically, you are defining that the that uh, the, the expiration date is much lower, much less than uh, a whole seed, right? So when it starts to 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 sprout, so you cut, it's a stress. You induce the potato to start to sprout, and that will not stop. So you cannot stop the clock anymore. Okay. And that's the kind of thing, right? And we know that the the planting is weather dependent, but uh, the seed once you cut and treat. They don't care. They will be ready for that day. Okay. I know that everyone is looking for a seed like this, right? The, the ideal type of seed, no disease, good size, uh, no bruise, uh, stored properly, grown uh, under no stress. And especially in a year like like this, right? Because that we are we are kind of short on this, on, on seed. Uh, this will be even more complicated, to my, more rare to find, right? But I know that uh, this, this would be the target, this is what every grower would be looking for. Seed growers to <coughs> grow this, this type of seed and the commercial growers to have access to this kind of seed, right? 
So, like I mentioned at the beginning, there's a lot of factors that can affect the seed performance. So, um, some of them uh, related to organisms, or and some of them or to the plant, and some of them um, not related to that, so the abiotic ones, which most of the, you know, actually, the main major one is the weather, which we cannot control. So, what I will do today is I will touch some of these items that uh, that actually impact the performance of the seed or the quality of the seed that we can handle, we can manage in a certain extent that we can control. Okay. So the first one of them is the seed transportation. So you, if, uh, if you're buying seed from someone else or from some other grower, this is a process that, that definitely is going to happen. So a few questions, a few points about that. So we need to define how to transport properly. You need to know how you'll be shipping that. You'll be shipping uh, bulk, you'll be shipping in, in bags, uh, totes. Uh, how long that will be the transit time? Are you bringing from Alberta, from Idaho, from Montana, or from New Brunswick, all right? Uh, so there's implications. And when you're bringing as well, because you, have, you don't want to have your potatoes exposed to freezing temperatures, right? Uh, uh, this kind of points is that uh, <coughs> uh, no matter what, if you don't get a, a good quality seed lot from the beginning, you cannot expect it to, to, the, the seed to get any better during transportation. Actually, it, it, because it won't. It's like to bring in you know, stuff, uh, bad potatoes into the storage and expecting to get good quality potatoes out of that. That's not going to happen, right? So. That's the reason why normally when we, we, we talk about transportation, there's a, some, some homework that needs to be done before that. You need to make sure that you know the lot that you're getting. So normally what, what, I, normally what I recommend to, to, to growers, and, uh, and not always we do that, but if you have a possibility to do that, check your lot. Uh, I know that's more difficult to, to do that if you're bringing stuff from the United States or from Alberta or from Western, Western Canada, but normally it's what I do. I normally go check the bin. Oh, this is the bin. Yeah, we can ship that one. I accept this, this seed lot. Uh, and especially when I have seen some growers that send one, one representative, one of the team members during the shipping time, you know, when they're grading and shipping, to make sure that the shipments are approved and that the quality of the seed is good. So most likely you will not have any surprise when you get when you open the door and open the, uh, you open the truck here. Okay. And uh, especially taking consideration the seed is very fragile. Um, uh, ensure that uh, at the, the shipping point the, the, the seed is not uh, uh, being graded at low temperature because it's easier to bruise. Especially the varieties that will have a higher specific gravity. It's kind of rule of thumb. There are some exceptions. But normally, when you get uh, big tubers of lots, seed, seed lots with big tubers, or um, varieties that uh, normally have high specific gravity, they normally tend to be more susceptible to bruise over handling, especially if they're handled at, uh, at uh, low temperatures. Um, another resource that you have is that you can start to warm up the temperatures during, your, during the transportation. So when you get here, actually, you get the potatoes. When you start to unload, you don't make that mistake if that was done there in the, during the shipping point with grading, uh, grading or shipping low uh, uh, temperatures, uh, tubers with low te under low temperatures. So at least when you get it here, you, your potatoes will not bruise again during the unloading. Uh, important too during the transportation to provide fresh air. And if you're not using, if you're using a driver that's not yours or that you don't know, make sure that uh, uh, the driver is aware, talking to your seed supplier, uh, that the driver um, understands and knows which kind of requirements on temperature, uh, aeration, and uh, uh, relative humidity, if the truck can control, the seed requires. Because if you have a long haul that you, need, you have days of transportation, the, the potatoes should have uh, should be maintained at a, a kind of a stable conditions, right? Otherwise, we have all other kind of issues that uh, we probably will mention later. The unloading process when you get the seed, kind of general rule of thumb, um, kind of uh, these are kind of conditions that we would like to see. 
Um, try to eliminate the bruising points. That uh, Ryan will have, has some really good slides to show you that. But these are kind of the recommendations that we have. Um, don't pile more than the, the higher than the five feet. I know that uh, normally we struggle with the space. We don't have room, so we end up, you know, getting higher. If you do that, um, which I have seen too, is that well, you need to get make sure that you have ventilation enough uh, to um, move all the moisture out of that, okay? Um, uh, because that helps you know the the healing process of the the wounds during the handling when you're unloading, okay? Uh, high humidity helps as well to the the, the, the healing process. Um, and make sure that temperature is kind of around those 50 to 55 degrees, which you need to be careful. And that's the reason why we need to seek to know your lot, because if your lot has issues, disease issues already, this actually will only boost your uh, the growth of that disease, especially uh, certain fungus like uh, like fusarium. So, uh, and um, um, when you get this. Um, uh, Get this exposed, the seeds exposed to this for the minimum three days to prevent soft rot, and uh, probably need more more days to get uh, to have issue, to avoid issues with other diseases, especially fungal diseases. And if you see that your 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 seed lot is not still skinny, you, it's not the, 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 the skin set is not it's not right yet, it's not uh, ready. Uh, you can actually keep longer to make sure that you have the new the new skin formation there. Okay? before you start to handle for, for the cutting process. Um, just quickly here, basically, the, 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 the piece is basically make, make sure that you disinfect everything in every step of the process, and uh, make sure that you treat that as gentle as possible and try to eliminate your bruising points. Okay? That's kind of message. So, uh, some some factors that uh, or some some situations that I have seen in the past, and uh, eventually it still happens here and there, uh, and it is possible to happen not not because the seed grower did that on purpose, but uh, eventually it, that that can happen. So I have seen seed lots with problems mm -hmm. with uh, herbicide residue on it, and, and maybe one of, some some of you have that that. that that problem before, or have or know someone that had that problem before. So um, I'm taking this material from a Andy Robinson, which had actually presented this before in other uh, events, and uh, he, and he is a really great expert on the on the um, uh, weed management and the, and the herbicides, especially on potato crops, and uh, uh, glyphosate or Roundup is one of the the most common ones that we start to, we, we see. Affecting potatoes, so in the, in the when the, the seed crop is being grown, eventually it got hit by by glyphosate uh, from the neighbor or uh, for some for some drift, or eventually uh, 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 sprayed uh, uh, during the uh, period of after planting because still. Some growers can, can do that if they have really issue, big issues with certain weeds. Uh, they can plant the potatoes and they can actually spray glyphosate before they, 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 they emerge uh, to try to control those weeds and eventually that glyphosate could be absorbed, especially when the plants are kind of uh, almost ready to emerge. So some of the glyphosate could be absorbed by those potato plants, which end up you know, accumulating on the, on the tubers. So those are kind of two situations that could happen, and eventually we have a problem. So, uh, and when that happens, you start to see, uh, unfortunately, situations like this in the field, uh, because the potatoes that the tubers that were affected by glyphosate uh, end up, you know, being severely affected uh, on the yield potential, 67% um, reduction in total yield. This is a study that was done in Burbanks. Uh, 50% reduction in tuber numbers and 30% reduction in, in the average weight of the tuber. So it's a big impact that you have, that you may have. How do you recognize that? Normally, is what you see is kind of a very uneven situation on the emergence in the field, uh, a really weak root system, 
uh, and uh, sometimes this is uh, this was the cities that was not emerged that so multiple types of a uh, team um, um, uh, stamps trying to reach or even stones in that case um, and uh, when it, before you plant actually you can see when it start to sprout they sprout like a cauliflower basically small cauliflower each one of the eyes okay and uh, if this reach to emerge you have this kind of situation of multiple stems kind of twisted leaves kind of a funny type of plant in the beginning which at certain point they start to recover depending on the on the how much actually glyphosate that the seed got so but this is kind of typical symptoms that you see on the seed lots that were impacted or, or by hit by glyphosate um, and I know Reinhard mentioned that the, the, the PEI agronomy website has a material that, uh, that can show not only this kind of symptoms caused by glyphosate, but by other types of uh, herbicides as well. Um, so this is one thing that you kind of watch out. You should be careful and uh, pay attention on when you are uh, checking the, when the seed, your seed lot starts to sprout. Okay. And uh, in that case, Andy, Andy Robinson had, had even had to develop a kind of checklist. If you see something like that in, in one seed lot that you have, you should probably document that to make sure that at the end of the day, we probably need to talk to your seed supplier. Um, and especially, it's, it's important to do document because a situation like this is not necessarily will be caused by glyphosate. There are other, other factors that can cause disease Seed, uh, seed with issues with diseases, or, or you have planted, you have a cut seed, and then suddenly you have a big change in temperature and the, and the yeah. soil moisture, and you start to see the seed rot pieces. And uh, so, the fact that you have a, an even emergence doesn't mean automatically that is glyphosate. Okay, there are other factors. So that's the reason why you have developed this kind of checklist. <laughs> So to make sure that you have the right diagnostic and to make sure that it is really glyphosate is not a disease or another, another factor that is causing that uh, unevenness on your uh, uh, crop emergence. The other thing that uh, I have seen here and there that you guys should be aware of is, well, if you have uh, your seed exposed to CIPC, yes, you, have, you, you can have some consequences, not good consequences, by the way. So this is a study that was done by um, a former colleague from, um, so John Walsh, he used to work for McCain, and um, he's retired now, but uh, he, he did even present this probably, some of you guys probably have seen this table before, uh, in one of the potato expos uh, that we had here on the island a few years ago. And uh, he did a pretty good study about that, you know. If you expose your potatoes to CIPC or seed potatoes to CIPC, what happens? So, when you talk about CIPC, is you're talking about really, really, really small amounts. Um, you see here, 0 0.025 parts per million. So, for people that are familiar with um, uh, gibberellic acid, gibberellic acid we use 13 parts per million, and is nothing. So, 0 .0 0 point, uh, 0 0.025 parts per million is really minimum amount. And the minimum amount on Burbank's he still was able to detect a 10% reduction on yield. Okay? And that doesn't happen in all the same way to different varieties. He had done a study on innovators, and innovators, same concentration, you don't, you don't basically uh, lose any. But at a certain point, the, as, 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 as the concentration goes up, you know the losses start to go up as well. Okay? So, it's the only study that was really done on processing potatoes, and uh, uh, he was able to prove that levels of 0 0.025 parts per million are, is, are enough you know, to cause damage or reduction on yield. So, and that doesn't happen only necessarily on your potato storage facility. 
that normally was the focus of the, his work, it could happen in your trucks as well, and you're transporting potatoes from some place to your your place. Because if you have a truck that was used to transport potatoes that had recently been treated with CIPC and was shipped to the plant, for example, or to the market, or to the to the washing plant, or to the to the packing packing house. Yeah, that truck has the residues of the CIPC in the, the whole surface of the truck. And if you use that same truck right after that, your seeds will be exposed to that. And then, like I said, we're talking about really, really tiny amounts that can actually impact your Did seeds. Did you say that was uh, potatoes that were just recently treated, or potatoes that were treated back in November or December? I believe that the recent treated they had more chances. Um, so I cannot tell. I don't have the. I, I haven't done this this trial, like John did for trucks. But uh, to eliminate risks, I wouldn't. I, I definitely wouldn't use that, <coughs> even with the potatoes that were treated the one, two, three months ago. Um, and as he mentioned. Um, Hot water, if you try to wash that truck with hot water, we will not be effective to remove CIPC from the truck as, 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 as well as not enough you know, to remove from the, the storage facilities. Just, okay. just to give you some context, yep. we did a little analysis in AIM three or four years ago where we worked with a grower. He had a building that hadn't had been treated in, with CIPC in five or six years, and it had been cleaned uh, in the meantime. But it wasn't, he wasn't putting seed in it, but he wanted to know whether we could put seed in it. And we took potatoes off the cutter that were coming off the, and they wouldn't have had any exposure to CIPC at this point. And I put them in that building for about two to three weeks. And then we took them and sent them for residue testing. And we were like midway down that chart. We are between 0 0.05 and 0 0.10. So that's just three weeks in a building that had been cleaned that had had CIPC five or six years ago. So it travels very freely through the air in those buildings and it can pick it up pretty easy. Yeah. So you're saying hot water is not effective, but are you saying disinfection only with steam? Yeah. yeah. Hot steam, steam seems to be hot steam. by the hot water. Yeah. So <laughs> hot, because all the hot water, you don't have the, the, the you don't get the, pre the, the temperature and the pressure that is required. So the study that he did is basically disinfection only with the steam that it will not eliminate, but can help. So it, there's no way, at least until now, that it's known that we can eliminate, completely eliminate to down to this level, CIPC from any surface. It's, it's denatured by hot temperatures over 100 C, yeah. and hot water, like even if you have boiling hot water, it gets to 100, right? Something, yeah. So it needs to be over 100. But like that's why in Europe, they're tearing down potato storages that were previously had CIPC treatment in it, because they can't have any CIPC residue anymore, so they right. can't put them in buildings that previously had CIPC treatment. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of buildings that they have, they have wood, yeah. which is worse, actually accumulates even more. Uh, John actually had found at that time that you know it, it, you can find it everywhere, uh, but uh, the higher levels that he found at that time was near the walls and the ventilation ducts, where basically uh, all the the, 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 the problem circulates, right? So an application. Go ahead. Have you seen any negative results to putting seed potatoes in a bin that's still damp from disinfection? Like we all disinfect with the same product, but yep. uh, I just heard two or three winters ago at one of these meetings, somebody said they wouldn't put a, a potato in a bin that was still damp on the floor or the walls from disinfecting like the day before. They wanted to have it dry. I've never worried about having it perfectly dry. Well, well, do you want to talk about that, uh, Rick? Or? Uh, it came up in a meeting yesterday. Yeah. And uh, I haven't seen any data per se on that, but the consensus at the mm -hmm. sessions were that we haven't noticed any impact of disinfectant on emergence or on seed quality. Okay. Because but I haven't seen any data on that specifically. Yeah. Because you're talking about the, the residue of the disinfectant, is yeah. that right? Yeah. So I, uh, both Rick and myself, we haven't seen that problem. The only 
concern that they would have is that you have that free moisture there. So the first, the, the, if the potatoes that are get wet on the bottom, yeah, well, those will, st will start to probably rot first. Eventually, if you if you don't have the right conditions to dry it out. So that's the reason why I would I would wait for one or couple couple more days to get that uh, and put some aeration to make sure that the floor is is dry before I add the, uh, my, my my seed there. Yeah, and I was asking for potatoes, not for sex. Sorry, I was asking about putting potatoes, not sex, not to cut potatoes on the wet floor, just the potatoes itself. Yeah, but it's still the same situation. Still I would say yeah. no, the, the 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 commercial potatoes, you mean, right? Yeah. Yeah. So it's still, we don't have free water there, so free moisture. Uh, yeah, no. It's no. Nah. But uh, to Rick's point is that the, 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 there was a question yesterday if uh, um, tubers exposed or seed tubers exposed to that uh, disinfectant solution would have any issue because you were talking about chemicals, right? Glyphosate, the CIPC, and now the disinfectant, the the, 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 the regular disinfectant solution that we use for for storage facilities. And uh, I haven't seen any problem. I haven't seen any problem in, in the stuff that we we we, we cut and process. Uh, and Rick either, right? You don't have any. No, like I think your comment about the moisture is a good one. You don't want free moisture because right. that's important. <laughs> um, but in terms of the actual chemical, I mean, there's lots of different disinfectants that have been used in the past. Things like the hydrogen peroxides, chlorine-based disinfectants. Sometimes they're used as a way to try to store potatoes longer, um, and there hasn't really been any negative impacts. The only times I've seen some negative impacts are if there's already disease in the pile or in the, in the tubers, and then when you're sort of sterilizing them with the disinfectant, sometimes the pathogen starts to take over a little bit. But if the tubers are, are sound and you have a you know, healthy set, we haven't seen any negative impacts. It's the only way to be sure, just give 10 potatoes a bath and put them in the ground and see how they do. <laughs> That's a good point. Good. So my, my question is, um, someone's coming to pick up a load of seed and a band trailer, and that band trailer maybe has been hauling uh, processing potatoes. What's the, what's the chance of uh, okay. contaminating the seed? So you're talking about the CIPC, right? Potatoes that tree were treated with CIPC. Well, how would, how would I know what people are treating their, uh, their, their processing potatoes with? So, chances are, well, you probably will, know, will not know because of the, 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 unless you talk to the truck driver and the truck driver knows the, 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 the potato owner, right? But, uh, uh, so chances are that if you are hauling potatoes, if he's hauling potatoes, yes. after probably March, April, 100% of their seeds will be treated with something. It could be CIPC, it could be Smart Block, it could be some other, some other but uh, definitely your potatoes will be treated with something, some kind of a, 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 a sprouting suppressant product which CIPC is still the major one that we use by cost and effectiveness. So the cost, the, the cost benefit is still the best on CIPC and the, or legislation PR, PMRA still allowing us to do that. I don't know if to, to win, but uh, we still have the, the possibility. So you will probably, will, unless you ask the truck driver in the head, he knows the grower. Um, the only thing that I can tell you is that uh, if you're hauling potatoes after probably March, February, March, the potatoes were treated with something. If it's CIPC or not, I don't know. But uh, chances are CIPC because it's the most cost effective at this point. There's some other products that are being used in association with CIPC. Smart Blocks is one of them. So at the end of the day, you still have CIPC on, the, on, the, on the your potatoes. Okay. I think to further his question, like, yep. so Somebody you hire a custom trucker to haul your stuff in from New Brunswick or wherever you're hauling from. Mm -hmm. That guy could have been hauling all the way along for who, uh, who knows who. What's the solution to best protect the seed? I guess so what's going in there? Well, we we kind of try to mitigate. So one of the things that, uh, for example, Kendall does in his farm, he's trying to do this. This effect with steam, 
at least he what he tries to do so he, his requirement is to have the, the trucks washed uh, uh, completely clean uh, and disinfected before he gets to his farm uh, he, he, he manages uh, seed farm or elite seed farms so after but even with that, he goes there and his team actually uh, disinfects with the, 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 the trucks again. So that's a, a, another layer that we have added in his operation to try to prevent that. Because he doesn't know as you or any of us here, well, where that truck has been, right? So um, that's basically what he does. He adds a kind of additional layer of protection to try to prevent this kind of situation with CIPC. Yes, Would there be any difference if you're hauling the seed in tote bags as opposed to just hauling in bulk? Like I believe so. Yeah. Yes, I believe so because you don't have the contact, direct contact with the, 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 the surfaces, right, with the, the CIPC. Um, and um, I, don't, I don't think that there's any study of that, but I, I, I feel that there's, there's a difference between uh, uh, hauling bulk uh, touching all the surface of the, 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 the truck that was exposed to CIPC and getting the in, in, in tops. Okay. Probably it would be safer, I would say, if you are exposed to that situation. What is uh, he using to disinfect the scene? Like, how does he create the scene? I don't know. I, I, I haven't seen that. Uh, I believe that he mentioned that uh, only generically speaking, but I, I don't think that he has many options uh, as we have right now. Um, because depend on the, and we don't have that many options because some of the disinfectants that were used in the past actually they're corrosive. So in um, in the United States, I don't know if it's registered here in Canada, they have another product called Green Shield that it was used for disinfection of the, the the facilities as well. I used to use that in greenhouses and uh, and storage facilities there. Uh, but right now, that uh, the, the blue one that we use is uh, basically this, probably the same one that. Uh, do you remember, Ryan? If he, I, if he when it comes to steam, like when they're doing the steam thing, they don't have a product in with a lot of time. It's just hot water, or yeah, just yeah. creating steam yeah. with a yeah. steam cleaner. So. so you can get that at Advanced Rentals or something like that. Right. Yep. Go ahead. So the so the risk would only be on the. A part of the potato that touches the surface. No, nope. the walls. No, nope. no. Nope. All like it goes through the air. Yep. So again, like we did ones where we did another trial where again we looked at the potatoes on the top surface of the pile, potatoes down in the pile. It's more on the stuff on the surface, but there, it is detectable in the pile. Too. If if it was if the potatoes are only in a truck for you know an hour or two hours or something like that, it'd be probably only the potatoes that are touching the surface of the, of the of the truck, or maybe even just the eye, that particular eye that is touch, touching the surface. Again, it doesn't have to be the surface. It's, it releases from the surface to the air. So it may be the potatoes on the top of the pile, if you've got them loose in the truck type thing, if the, like I was saying, the top of the truck yeah. or something like that. Yeah. But and, the, and the exposure time probably will be crucial. If you're saying one hour, I, I, I see a low risk. Yeah. <clears throat> but Ryan is correct. It's, it's not because only it's, it's, it's only then the... Uh, in the surface, it's accumulated in the surface uh, that uh, actually the potatoes will not be affected. So, of course, that if, if you add some layers or barriers to try to avoid or to reduce this air exchange, probably you mitigate the problem. This is one, and secondly, as you mentioned, if it's exposed for one hour, chances are, well, because one hour is very different from the two, three weeks that, we, that the exposure that was done. At the it's probably less of an issue for the potatoes that are going back and forth in PEI. Yep. It's more of an issue if it's coming from from other places, away where long it's calls, a exactly. full yeah. day travel time or something yeah. like that, right? Yeah. So. yeah, so it sounds like there might be impacts that we're not really documenting. Or, no, no. Uh, I, don't, I don't think that anyone has any data showing that. No, yeah. and so for those potatoes that are perhaps coming from off island and traveling in a long ways, is there a way to find out if those trucks have been properly cleaned and disinfected, that's a question you can ask. Quite often those potatoes might be coming in tote bags where certainly less exposure. Right. But to Ryan's point there, that's still in the air. Yeah. It would still get through with, yeah. Which, which will all depend on the, 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 the original amount that you have in the, on 
the, if the concentration is low, probably you have less chances to get the issues in your truck load and your seat load. Uh, but if the concentration of the, the, the CIPC on the, I mean, the truck is high, you have, of course that you have more and more chances to have a potential problem, right? Is hot water not effective or not as effective? It's not effective. So it, like, it's not even worth doing at all, cleaning something with hot water? Well, for things other than CIPC. No, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure, but in this context. Like, for CIPC, it, uh, no. Okay. But when you're saying a steam, like steam cleaner, that's just a hot water pressure washer. But it's more than just a pressure washer. It's like a true steam cleaner. Machine. Like so, it's making sure you keep at a constant temperature, well in excess of a hundred degrees. Yeah. Right? So it has a so it generates hot uh, te temperature and pressure, which actually helps. To, well, like a, there's different models that you can. You don't even need to buy it. You, like Ryan said, rented. there's some companies here on the island. We have rented one of those as well. That uh, you can rent per day or per week, or, and uh, it generates that steam. Of course, it generates hot water first, but with the pressure, actually, that turns into steam, which is more effective according to the study that John was had done. I think that's the issue: is the temperature, right? I mean, boiling water. You, know, you can't keep hot water hot enough. Yeah, that's why you have to go with steam. Yeah. Any more questions about CIPC? I know that's. Is, is, it, is a, it could be a hot topic because it's, 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 we don't know exactly how to eliminate that. There's no way other than the, what he had found out about uh, using steam. Um, I think for a lot of people that take home, like we talked a lot about trucks and stuff here, and I, that is important, yeah. but it's about when you're cutting seed at home and not putting them in a building that you know has been treated with CIPC. Because yeah. yeah. even as you said, even when it's been cleaned and even when maybe the treatment was a while ago, it can still be there. Yeah. So it's something to kind of keep, it, keep in mind. Yeah. So to focus, if you, uh, Ryan just mentioned that, you know, make sure that you don't put your stuff in the facility that you had CIPC before. Doesn't matter if one, two, three, five, five years, it's to find other residue. And uh, maybe this is kind of information, so watch out if, you, if you're if you talking to your seed supplier, make sure that he pays attention on this as well. And uh, on when, he, when you are making an arrangement or he's making an arrangement of the, uh, for the logistic, um, taking care of the, make sure that you pay attention to the, the CIPC potential residues of that. So if a guy is, Grading a seed potatoes and he's in a shed and he's separating the large ones and they're going one direction being sprayed with drought and having her to go on the market and the seed potatoes are going over that way onto your truck to go home and plant. Is, is that a risk? If you're using the same truck? No, I mean they're going in two different directions. Conveyors are being separated. In, 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 in the same building they're, they're applying CIPC to the large ones to go to, to the market, right? Yep. And the small ones are going in your cup to be. If they are physically separated, and well, normally, normally we try to avoid that situation. I know that so, uh, some of you uh, have that situation, but uh, uh, we try to avoid to get uh, uh, in the same site, or physically speaking, side by side. One you use for CRPC, <laughs> another one you use to store your seed. You try to avoid that. But they know that no, not always that's required. And the re uh, it's possible, sorry. Um, um, because there are limitations on the physical space or that you cannot separate physically. But the problem is that the risk is when you get a, a, a facility that has is treated with CIPC and another facility that has seed, uh, you always have a risk to get contaminated because, as Ryan mentioned, the CIPC can be spread through the air. And you need to actually do that because you need to refresh your potatoes, right? So the solution that we found for that is that I have a kind of similar situation there in the, at, the, at Cavendish because I don't know if you guys have seen that the new uh, breeding storage facility, this kind of uh, almost in front of Dave Delauder's, uh, you know, the new, new storage facility <coughs> where we had our field day, okay? So we are talking about probably 100 meters away or not even that. So every single time that the CIPC is applied or we have the ventilation of that, I basically shut down my, shut down, not shut down, but I, I close all my louvers, close everything 
on the air circulation. So I, not, I don't bring any air from outside during the time that actually they are refreshing the, the, the they are applying the CIPC and they are uh, uh, refreshing the air on, that, on those beams. So that's the way that I was I found to mitigate that risk. So uh, that's the way to avoid the situation when you have potatoes going to both directions and the, and the potatoes that are the big ones that will be commercial will be treated. Those are the ones that if you have your, your facility open, you probably should shut, uh, close it and uh, shut the external ventilation bringing in, you know, sh uh, stop doing that until you get uh, treated and refresh that uh, the CIPC facility. Okay? That's, what I, that's what we are doing and so far we haven't had any issues with that, following that procedure. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yeah. Dormancy uh, is a topic that we've been I have been presenting this for, for uh, or talking about that for, for a few years already. Uh, but uh, this, this topic is always relevant because it's one of the key things. You can get the best quality in your seed, but if you don't handle that dormancy piece properly at uh, planting time, you have still issues um, uh, to optimize the results of your crops. So, simple understanding that uh, when you have the two graphic, two, two pictures here, one illustrates basically the apical dominance phase, when you have basically one, only one of the apical, domin uh, apical uh, sprouts coming, and the second phase that you have the multiple sprouting, that's kind of more desirable, is basically a balance of different hormones that you have inside of the tuber, okay? In the beginning, you have tubers that are inhibiting the sprouting process, and when the potatoes are stored for a long time, Period of, uh, long period of time, those other type of hormones actually that stimulates the sprouting actually start to increase the concentration inside the tuber, and you get kind of the situation that you start to sprout initially, and after that you have multiple sprouts coming. On this initial stage, so from dormant to start to sprout, <coughs> basically the storage temperature has a big influence on that, and uh, uh, after it starts, not only that, but we have the time for how long you as you try to keep that uh, to, to reach the multiple sprouting uh, step or uh, phase. Um, so we have done this work for four years, the last four years. 19, 20, 21, and 22 crop season. So what I have here is basically information to answer this question. How long it takes to start for the, for the, for the potatoes or the seeds to start to sprout? Uh, so to get this done, I know that you guys will not be doing this with your seed, but I had to store at 50 degrees and keep the re relative humidity to 70 to 80 percent. Why I did for uh, why I had that exposed to 50 degrees? Because I had to actually accelerate this sprouting process to be able to share this information with you guys before the crop season starts. Okay? I know that you guys will not be keeping at 50 degrees. You probably will be keeping at 38, 39 degrees, right? So, this is what I found out here. You have the main commercial varieties that we're dealing with right now, that we're contracting. And uh, this, in this uh, axis here, we have the days from the harvest, that was October, first week of October, in all these years, to uh, 160 days here after harvest. So these are each one of the varieties. The color coding here is simple. Reds are my checks. Oh, sorry. Uh, I, I did wrong here. <laughs> Alverstone, it's supposed to be uh, Shepherd. Okay. So I have Prospect, Shepherd, and Burbanks as my controls. Oh, something was wrong in here. Again, I did the, so Shepherd should be the red one here, okay? So uh, Prospect, Shepherd, and uh, Burbanks are my controls. So I have that every every single year. And you can see that uh, certain varieties start to sprout earlier. So basically, the time that I have measured is 67 days after harvest is where I start to see the first tuber sprouting. Okay, it's not the whole lot. First tuber that I saw in the sample, I saw sprouting, that's the day that I have recorded here. Okay, so that's the day that starts to break the dormancy. So that was, 
potatoes, basically those were potatoes that we have harvested in 2018 and they kept under storage for the winter, 20, winter spring 2020. Following year, crop season 2020, the potatoes that are harvested had a big difference on timing, right? You remember why? What happened in 2020? Over. <laughs> Besides <laughs> COVID. <laughs> That's a good point. I should be more specific. <laughs> During the crop season, for the potato crop season in 2020, we had a really stressful year because we had a lot of heat and a lot of really stressful year, really. very stressful as well. We have, well, high team was stressful as well. Right? But uh, um, 2020, we had uh, uh, even the worse conditions because we have a, um, a warmer summer with a really uh, uh, temperatures above above the average, and we didn't have water enough, right? So those factors in combination basically had stressed a lot the the whole potatoes that we had, uh, including the seeds that we have collected the, the, uh, that we were, we were grown that, that that year. So that accumulation of the, that impact of the stress had to reflect on the, on the seed. Stressful uh, potatoes or tubers uh, submitted or, uh, um, or uh, exposed to stressful conditions, actually, they anticipate the sprouting process. And that is exactly what happened with all of them. Doesn't matter which variety, because all of them were planted at the same time in the same place. Okay? So that happens. So, um, and it varies according to the year. So can you see, do you probably remember, 2021 was a good year, right? Crop season, uh, it was a good crop season, right? What happens with the same study? You see how short it was in 2020? Dry, heat, here we have water, almost in a, in a good, Almost in perfect conditions. So it, again, it, it elongates or it extends the, so the potatoes feel more comfortable. They're not stressed, they're more relaxed, so they keep dormant for a longer period of time. Okay? Um, 2021, I need to be careful here because uh, we had overall in the center, in the west, a good crop season. I know that here in the east, we had more issues last year, right? Especially lack of water, right? So this study was done central PEI. So we had good conditions there. That's the reason why what's happening with the seeds that are stored right now, they possibly will be looking kind of showing a very similar trend from the previous crop season, okay? There are a couple of comments that I need to make here um, uh, to share with you here. First thing, if you guys remember, we had a kind of mild uh, fall. We were able to actually store, uh, to, to dig until end of October, even beginning of November last year, right? Okay. These potatoes were dug first week of October. So if there's any grower here that uh, had uh, ex uh, dug your seeds by end of October, you definitely got your seed more aged than the ones that I have in my trial. Okay, because I have dug in the beginning of October. If you left your potatoes exposed to the kind of warmer temperatures during the whole month of October, which was the case, your seeds more aged, and your results probably will be a little bit different from the ones that I have here. It will anticipate this sprouting process. Okay, and I have to be talking, telling that to, to, the, to the farmers um, um, uh, in, the, in the central and then the west as well. The second factor that can affect if you have any seed that you have grown last year that in your storage is that uh, we had in central. Uh, good conditions. I wouldn't say optimal conditions because we had two windows that I had three weeks without any rain, even central PEI. But they're not consecutive windows, so I had a 
three weeks no 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 rain, but after that we got a period of two three weeks of rain, and suddenly after that you know beginning of August end of July beginning of August we had again a gap with, without rain. So uh, seeds that you have grown here that have uh, were exposed to longer period of time under stress, uh, uh, dry stress, you probably probably your seed that you have here. Um, will have a shorter dormancy, okay? So we will not, probably will not replicate the same thing that I got there in central PEI, okay? Just keep that in mind. <coughs> the other thing that I was trying to understand is and try to answer is this, okay, on each one of these varieties, when the seed will be ready to plant? So ready to plant means not only when they start to sprout, but when I have at least 90% of my tubers sprouted, okay? So I have measured that too. So from the, har from the day that I have harvested the, the, my seeds, that was beginning of October, when exposed on that, that, that 50 degrees and the 80, 70 to 80% of relative humidity, uh, how long it will take you know, to get my, red, my seeds ready to plant, to take to the field? Uh, and you see the differentiation between the varieties. So that was 2019. Same thing, so the same thing happened, so the same trend happened in 2020, you know, shorter period of time to get seeds ready to go to the field. 2021 takes longer because we, have got, we got a good season. And so far, this is still, I'm still running this, this trial, but I was able to to get consolidate some information on Tuesday, that was the, the, read, the day that we do reading every week, every Tuesdays uh, since November, uh, we have been doing this, this uh, readings, weekly re readings, and uh, Altia hasn't uh, sprouted 90% yet. <coughs> Payet Russet hasn't sprouted, reached 90% of the uh, tuber sprouted yet, and Burbex either. Uh, Altia, I believe it was 56%, Payette was kind of 40%, and uh, Burbank was around 16% uh, of the tubers product by Tuesday, last two, couple days ago. Okay? So I, I don't see a major risk that potatoes will be sprouting too early this year, okay? based on what we are seeing uh, so far. <coughs> Which is a kind of a guidance, general guidance, you know, for you guys on, about how to handle your seed. Taking consideration that uh, this was harvested beginning of October. If you have a seed that was harvested later than that, uh, uh, just pay attention that probably your dormancy will be a little bit shorter than that, than what I have here, okay? But what I try to show here is basically there is a trend that certain varieties will be always starting to sprout earlier than others. And some of them, they will be taking much more time. Okay? Which helps in two things. Uh, and your decision making about uh, which ones um, you will be storing together eventually in the same bin at the harvest time. Because some of them, if they, they, they start to sprout too early, uh, you don't want that one in the back of your bean and the one long term, and the, well, another one with long dormancy in front of the bean, right? You don't want to do that. So, but if you have two that start to sprout at kind of the same time, you can actually put them together, which actually works for the same thing on your planting when you are getting your seed from your seed supplier or when you are handling your own seed. You put your varieties that actually have a shorter dormancy together, and you kind of manage handle uh, manage those that way. And then in a different bean or a different space, you start to manage the, the varieties that they actually take longer, okay? Which eventually need more time to make them sprout. Or you put another bean to expose them to a different temperature. That's another tool that you can use, okay? Um, I have uh, put together some information in the, uh, in the, in the next few charts of, about that. So the other thing that I believe that we need to pay attention on is to understand each one of the varieties they behave in a different way about when they start to sprout and when they actually reach the, the final 
90% at least potatoes sprouting. This is important because uh, sometimes you have an uneven situation of emergence in your field and you start to think, oh, that was glyphosate, oh, that was a disease, or oh, that was, what, what was, what is causing that? So you start to dig, right? First thing that you start to do is dig, dig your fields. You say, oh, well, I don't have a plant here, start to dig, and the plant's still there. The, the seed is still there, still intact, but idle, doing nothing, right? And uh, you see that in more, in, all, in, in some varieties, probably more than other varieties. And this is an explanation why you, you, you don't want to see that. It's because certain varieties, and it kind of depends on, depends on the year as well, uh, uh, but normally there's a trend that's kind of general behavior, they kind of normally, they, they, they tend to, to behave in kind of in, a, in, a, in, a, in the same way, in a similar way, despite the, 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 the variations between the seasons. Uh, normally varieties that, in, uh, uh, there are varieties that actually from the first tuber that start to sprout to 90% of the tuber sprouted, you can get that in four weeks or less. There's some other varieties that to, when they start to sprout, they, they start to sprout so uneven and an uneven way that they take up to almost two months to get to, to the point of the reaching 90 or 100% of the tuber sprouted. And that can, in part, help you understand or to explain why those kind of, uh, why you don't have 100% of, uh, even if you have a perfect planter, you, you may not have 100% of emergence in your, in your crop. Okay? The reason why you don't see that, you don't see plants probably emerging at 56 days, right? Well, you eventually can see that, but it's not common, is because we cut seed. That's not the case that they have here. All the stuff that they have here is whole seed. So the assessment that is done on these potatoes are whole seed. Naturally speaking, you put the seeds there, under that exposed to that temperature, that relative humidity, no lights, put in the cooler, every week I take a look. When you add another component that called uh, seed cutting, you actually add in a stress. Every single time that you cut seed is a wound that needs to be healed. And that stress is a factor that will accelerate the process or will induce the process to put for the potatoes or the tubers to sprout. That's the reason we most likely will not see this big variation of 56 days or 60 days uh, uh, that we find. <laughs> Even Montagena, not that Montagena, there's a lot of growers that actually like Montagena. I like Montagena too. But uh, Montagena has this kind of uneven type of sprouting. It's a habit of that variety. Go ahead. So with mountain gems, it would probably be a variety that, that would be an advantage to uh, cut early and like, cut two or three weeks ahead of time and... Pre-cut. Pre-cut? Yes. And I will show you that. Okay. So the answer is yes. Okay. Because then you will not see this. So the, and the, the, that's probably the reason why you don't see a uneveness that bad in, 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 in mountain gems. Unless it's caused by other factors, right? But not because of the dormancy. Because on the seed cutting process, actually, we cut almost every single seed of, Burma, the, of mountain gems because the seed is long, right? Just curious, back to that previous yep. slide. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, so in in 2019-20, Russell Burbank sprouted in 13 days. Yes, the, it did. And, but it's at the bottom on the. It is. In the next yeah. year, you know, yeah. And the, and the, yeah, and the, the the kind of the trend is to be here on the bottom. See, 2021 and 20 well 2022. I still don't have it because it's still there. Okay. Okay. Still there, but most likely. So Altias, Payets, and Burbanks, those are, those are the ones that I, I haven't completed yet. They haven't completed the, the dormancy. Uh, they haven't reached the 90% yet. They most likely will be in this ranch here again. So if you ask me what is the, what happened here. It just looks like an anomaly in 2019. It was, yes. Yeah. I would say yes, because I don't have an explanation. Okay. 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 It was really weird because we know that Burbanks, they, they normally have a, a, 
uh, along dormancy. It's it's very well known. Yeah. And, and a tendency towards second set. Sorry. And a tendency towards second set. So then. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So which makes it even more comp even worse, right? Because it gets even more more dormant. So the stuff that comes on the second setting, uh, which normally happens with Burbanks, uh, it could be down the bottom here. Like it did happen here in 2020. It did happen here in 2021. And uh, it is most likely happening here as well. So I still probably need three or eventually four more weeks and order to get this completed. So hopefully by, by the... Um, by the spring for an event in, on 27, I will have that completed already, okay? But that was a good observation because I said, wow, this is point outside of the group. So all that study, I believe that we can translate or simplify all this um, to help you to manage your crops when you are storing your potatoes or when you are actually handing your seed during the spring, so you can plan actually how to use your storage facilities and which varieties you can try to combine with what uh, uh, to be able to, to facilitate or to help uh, on, your, on, on the management. So two key pieces of information here. So we, I have split those varieties in short, uh, varieties with short, uh, group, three different groups. Whereas I have short dormancy, medium dormancy, and long dormancy, based on those the, the, the length of those bars that they have shown those, those previous graphics. So Altias, Dakotas, Payettes, and Brussels Burbanks normally are the last ones that start to sprout. Okay? Alverstones, Alverstone is not so far from Altia, it's the same as Campania. You do, we don't, I don't think that we have many maritime residents here. Uh, but they kind of the same group, but the Alverstones and Campanias more kind of a medium long type of uh, dormancy. Um, sh and the short dormancy, you know, normally prospect, shepherdies, tarhees start to sprout, and mountain jam uh, is kind of short to, to need, but I, I decided to put it here because it eventually may start to sprout there, there as well. Okay? And based on the how long it takes to, from the first potato to sprout and to complete the 90%, I had generated the second flow here when, uh, in theory, you can expect more uniform type of uh, uh, emergence in the field. Assuming that you're not cutting seed, okay, that's basically my data. Altias, prospect, star he's and shepherd is if you cut seed, you actually only help the process to get a more uniform stand or emerges in the field. But if you don't cut seed, uh, if you plant whole seed, these crops probably, this varieties will have more uniform crops in the field. Alverstones, Campanias, Dakotas, and Maritimes kind of uh, in the middle. It doesn't take uh, uh, 25 days, but it doesn't take 50, 60 days. It's kind of in between. And, uh, and the ones that if you don't do anything and plant only whole seed, mountain jams, payettes, and burbanks, you see more variation on that, okay? Which, real life, for us, that's not going to happen that frequently because payette has big tubers. Mountain jam, big tubers. And burbanks is long. Well, not always you get big tubers, but uh, you will be cutting that anyway. So the cutting process actually makes this uh, uh, less as an issue, but you may see, if you start to, to plant only whole seed, more variation on the um, uh, crops on these varieties here, okay? One thing that I think we, we could experiment a little bit with in terms of getting the uniformity of emergence, like, and holding seed on some of these shorter dormancy varieties longer, yeah. is the ethylene. Um, because when we did the trials with ethylene, it keeps it dormant longer, but then when it wakes up, all the eyes come at once, as opposed to just the apical end. That's right. So. Yep, yep. This is one, uh, you're absolutely right, uh, Ryan, this is one. Uh, the ethylene, and uh, we are, we tried another product that is called, uh, one for seed, which is actually is a 
suppressant of <laughs> uh, 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 sprouting. But if you are late, kind of, if you if you feel that you'll be late on your planting, and you have a variety that actually uh, s s sprouts earlier, but it has a kind of uneven sprouting process, that's another one that we 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 have tried and. Uh, it seems like uh, it didn't cause any trouble, it didn't cause any problem for the emergence, it didn't cause any impact, negative impact on the yield as well. And the, and the third possibility is that you spray GA when you are cutting your seed as well. That uh, some growers actually they do, which does similar what uh, ethylene does, uh, to try to help on this uh, improving the uniformity. But uh, normally what I have seen, uh, despite the, the 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 research saying because the way the, the, the ones that the say that actually we can have big have, we have a big spread here on the uh, on the germination on the sorry the, in the sprouting the, the the seed cutting process basically addressed most of the issues or potential issues of the lack of uniformity on the on your crops okay. Well, Ryan mentioned that uh, some of the products that we can actually help to play with or manage uh, tuber physiological age. Uh, I talk about a lot about this uh, um, when we talk about seed because at, at the end of the day, this is critical. Everything is related to understand how the seed works. Okay, it's a live organism, so we need to understand exactly physiologically how it works. To be able to play with that and, uh, and to get the results that we want, okay. So physiological age, the truly physiological age actually is measured since the day that actually the tubers are formed, which in uh, real life is impossible to measure, right? So what normally we do is basically when we use as a parameter at harvest time which is not the right one, but is the practical one. Um, so the physiological age can be impacted by many different factors. Growing season, like I mentioned that, if you bruise, so cutting is one of them, is one type of bruise. Uh, the seed storage conditions, especially the temperature relative humidity, because you can keep at three, three and a half degrees, but if you don't store that at 95% plus relative humidity, the tubers will start to uh, gradually dehydrate and dehydration or sort of shrinkage actually accelerates the physiological you age the seed faster if you do that so if you tell me oh the tomato is I store at 2.9 degrees wow okay but what was your relative humidity oh it depends sometimes it was 92 percent sometimes it was 85 well that's what happens when you start to accelerate, you start to age your seed. That's the reason why you start to sprout earlier than you are expecting. Or you have a higher shrinkage than you are expecting as well, right? Genetics, so you saw that actually there's a variation between the <coughs> other varieties. Uh, and cutting operation is one of the bruise, what they call bruise, because this is stress that, you, that you're causing. Uh, so, you know, multiple steps, you don't plant dormant tubers, you don't plant uh, tubers that are too old because they actually will not get anything decent in your crop. Uh, so you, we, we try to kind of keep that in here. And depend on what you want. Um, if you're planning, planning to use small tubers, probably you, you probably should manage that in a different way. Small whole tubers, you play with your spacing and probably better to get, you know, apical instead of a multiple. Otherwise, you probably will get uh, lots of small tubers. But uh, if you want to use your small seed, and we will talk about seed size in, in, in a few minutes, um, if you want to get commercial size potatoes in small seed pieces, you probably should not go to uh, more aged seed. You should probably keep them kind of uh, younger. If your target this guy is kind of to produce seed, it's a different way. You need to move that way. Instead of being uh, young, you need to go to kind of more aged seed so you get a larger set, more, more stands, and possibly more kind of a balanced size. And probably we'll be talking about the seed size and the 
and mountain jams, and mountain jams has to, to do with this is one of the ways to kind of manage whole heart. Probably is one of the topics that will show up some. If not today, probably on, t on 27. Okay, so physiological age trials. So what I did, I have been done doing this uh, for four years already. But what I was doing before was basically isolating the factors. So I was aging the seed through temperature first. And uh, as one way to get the seeds uh, to see if we could improve the performance of certain varieties, especially the low setting varieties. Who's, who's growing Dakotas, Prospects, and Payets here? Okay, so this is for you guys. And uh, on the other hand, um, Ryan was working with ethylene and uh, 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 through AIM, and I was working there on the, at Cavendish with um, um, uh, gibberellic acid to see if it, we could actually increase the number of stems, increase the number of uh, uh, tubers, and get better yields. Uh, or at least a more, more balanced size uh, uh, for growers that could ev eventually use uh, for commercial crops and, 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 uh, and split uh, the crop in two. Uh, shipping some of the seed or keeping some of the small potatoes for the seed as seed. So, uh, but I was doing that separately. So I had the results only using the aging and only using gibberellic acid. So this this time I start to well. Some of you guys actually have asked me the question: well, What happened if you put both of them together? So it's what I did. So this is the first one that's checked, you don't do anything. You just keep the seed the way it is. The second one, I just used 30 parts per million of gibberellic acid. The third treatment, I just, I just did the pre-sprouting, no gibberellic acid. And the fourth treatment, I did both of them. I aged the seed through temperature first, and after that, I have treated gibber with gibberellic acid during my seed cutting process, okay? What is pre-sprouting? Do you know what pre-sprouting pre is? Pre-sprouting is basically I move from three and a half degrees, increase for 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 uh, temperature during the two weeks. I expose to indirect light and gradually increase the temperature to 50 degrees, and uh, those two weeks under um, indirect light. So it stimulates, or well, the temperature stimulates to sprout, and when the sprouts st sprout start to come, they come more robust. You don't have the the white thin sprouts. Because they have the, the indirect lights, they, they, they turn green, they don't grow, they get small, robust. So when you do that, uh, actually most of those sprouts, even after the cutting, you don't, you don't get broken. And those are functional eyes or sprouts that you, you want to help you emerge faster. Okay. Um, so we did on the, I focused on the work, especially in the, in the low setting varieties. So starting with Dakota Rusty first. Uh, two ways that I can, I, 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 we can see this information, okay? So here are the treatments. So this is the check. So how to understand, how to interpret this table is this. The information that is green here, painted green, is because it's better than the check. Significantly better. So there's all statistics involved on this, all replicated. And what is red is worse, significantly worse than the, 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 the check. So on the color residents, we got an increase, a significant increase on number of stands and especially when you associate pre-sprouting with GA in tuber set as well, compared to the check. When I did the pre-sprouting, actually I didn't get any benefit out of that. Okay? And normally, gibberellic acid, that is the main goal. You're, you're looking for uh, more stems and more tubers. You are not expecting to get big, two, three big tubers. You want to get like six, seven, eight average. Uh, size tours. Yeah. No, this is this is great. That I can actually even see better my numbers here. Uh, 
And uh, I know that probably you, you guys would be concerned about this. Oh, Newton, but this is bad for us, right? Well, depends on how you see it. Of course, that if you are, you are a commercial grower and you are using that only for commercial purposes or to ship the plant, potatoes to the, to, the, to the plant, of course, that there's an impact because you are increasing or you are decreasing or eliminating almost basically the, the amount of uh, uh, 10 ounces which I know that's an important component on your pay, because there is a bonus related to that. And you're increasing a lot in the percent of the smalls. The smalls, I'm talking about the one seven eighths of an inch, okay? Which is the, the same that, uh, uh, that we have in contract. When you see this here, it's important to understand. So uh, this penalty that you see here on the pay, which is a significant one, is because of the size. It changed the size profile, what it does supposed to do, okay? And uh, it varies according to the variety. You see on Dakota, it's a big impact here, right? Significant impact. It impacts on the size profile because you see the total yield, there's no difference. There's no significant difference. So to understand these numbers on statistics, I don't know if it, and I know that growers normally don't like this, uh, but uh, it's, it's simple. I try to simplify this, even the statistics piece. If the difference between this one and this one is larger than 35, it's significant difference. If it's less than 35, it's not. Which means that uh, in, if I have 100, 100 trials exactly the same like this for 100 years, or I don't need to do that for 100 years. If I do that in 100 different sites, we don't want to do that, right? We, not that long. Not that long, right? <laughs> but if we do 100, 100 different sites, probably in 95 of them, it will show me this same kind of results here. Okay? That's kind of the, 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 the basis of the statistics. It's, it's kind of a simple concept. It's not really, really like that, but it's kind of a, it's an easy way to understand why the, how do I calculate these numbers and what is red and what is, what is uh, green, okay? <coughs> so when you see there's an impact on the commercial, the numbers here, ah, oh, you have to forget about that, or Dakota, no, that doesn't work. Um, but well, I knew that you, you would see that, so I start to do the, a different analysis on that as well. Okay, the same potatoes that I got on that, on that, uh, on that plot, on that uh, uh, treated. Let me actually split that and start to grade by size for a seed grower. So less than two ounces, two to four ounces, four to six, six to eight, and above eight. Normally growers, go ahead, sorry, no problem. Uh, normally growers don't want to get seeds above eight ounces, right? They, 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 they see, see the see, uh, tubers. Um, and here is the kind of the thing that was interesting because um, the aging process combined with the gibberellic acid to actually increase your number of tubers that basically what you're targeting to get on this treatment. So only GA increased the, the number of tubers in 10%. Well, good, well, good, not great. But when you combine aging plus gibberellic acid, even on the, on the low setting variety like Dakotas, you increase by 30% the numbers. Uh, that's the reason why you get it 7 to 10. And it's not easy to see 10 tubers on Dakotas, right? Uh, that brings me the question, the, 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 the point that I, I understand that still is not good enough for the quotas because, well, Newton, the way, if I'm a seed grower and I sell seeds, I still sell by 100 weight. So if a uh, gibberellic acid impact my, my yields, uh, I will not use it, which I understand and I agree, okay? Um, and this is a system that we have here in Canada and we have in the United States. The rest of the world actually commercialize seed in a different way, right? They don't, they don't sell necessarily by 100 weight. They sell by range of tubers that you can get or how many acres you can plant with that, uh, with uh, one bag, okay? How many, uh, how many bags you need per acre to, to plant your seed? Depending on the seed size, depending on this. They, instead of ounces, the Europeans actually basically they dominate the, the, the exporting market for seed in most of the most of the countries. They they range by millimeters, right? Diameter. 
35 to 55, 55, 65, and so on, which kind of mimic in a different way what we're doing here. Okay? So maybe the day that we actually have a change on the way that we commercialize seed, uh, this could be used for the coil of acid. But when you see, go to a different variety, like Prospect, look at that. Still does the job, both the pre-sprouting and the, and the, and the gibberellic acid compared to the check. Um, so it increased the number of stems, increased the number of tubers, and of course that will impact on the reduced the size profile, so less 10 ounces, more smalls, okay? Didn't have any impact on total yield. Actually, we had a positive impact, well, a little bit of a, a, um, a impact on the, on the total yields, but pay yields kind of the same. And uh, same, or no significant uh, impact on the, on the payouts as well. So that for commercial growers on prospect could be something to help because it can increase your number of tubers. Okay. And for seeds, even better benefits that we were able to see that here, the, the same 30%, but the gibberellic acid alone, 21%. Uh, uh, when you do only pre-sprouting in, uh, in case of prospect, only the age in it was not enough to reduce the, uh, the number of eight ounces if you are a seed grower. Okay? It was basically the same. Very similar numbers. Check and, uh, and uh, the pre-sprouting, check, pre-sprouting, check, pre-sprouting, and so on. If you go to a third variety, Payette, it's a kind of similar trend that we had on the Dakota Russet, right? It does its job again. So uh, the pre-sprouting process basically was very similar to what the check is, doing nothing. But you age the payettes, and that's something that we probably will be uh, stimulating or uh, uh, recommending growers to do. Uh, because payettes is a variety that has a low set. Uh, and especially is a variety that actually takes a long time to emerge. Whoever had an uh, opportunity to, to deal with that variety uh, know, knows what I'm talking about. It, instead of taking three, four, or eventually four and a half weeks to emerge, it will take five, eventually even six weeks to emerge, to fully emerge. Okay? So that's the one variety that we are looking for, something that <coughs> will accelerate the, the emerging process. And uh, especially on, on, the, on, on payettes, there is a big impact on the used hormones on it. So you see all the gibberellic acid increasing 45%, the number of tumors alone. And if you combine with aging, you get up to 70% the number of, of uh, tumors. Uh, the, extra, the extra yield in using GA, yep. even for processing, more offsets advantage wise versus losing your 10 ounce, 10 ounce bonus. Like you don't get as much 10 ounce when you use GA, but the extra yield you get, a better return. Yeah, yeah, that's, and that will, will be kind of case by case, but you're right, it, it, can, it, can, off, it can offset, absolutely. So that's the reason why uh, the, the, the use of gibberellic acid is kind of, uh, you need to be careful with certain things. Uh, the pre-sprouting process, it will become more common um, as long as uh, growers have keep, start to build capability to store in boxes. So you can age them. There are some growers in Central and in, in, in West that are already doing that. And they are seeing the benefits of doing that. So Kendall's operation is moving to that and, the, and Juniper or seed operation is fully in box as well. And actually, you, that's the reason why I'm kind of talking about pre-sprouting because I can see that some growers are moving already to that, to that direction and can see the benefits. I know that it requires some investment, uh, um, which is not easy to get, but uh, you probably will see certain varieties, especially these new varieties, when you get this pre-sprouting done or you use other tools like gibberellic acid and you can do that, um, you will start to see the benefits. Um, and not necessarily some negative impacts on, on, on the pay yield, okay? This was controlled this, this, this way. Uh, I have seen payettes in the past 
the past few trials uh, with GA without an impact on the on the pay yield. So it's a matter probably on adjusting how you treat your um, seed with GA as well. The other thing that is important to mention, every single time about that I talk about GA, uh, I have noticed in the, in the last uh, few years uh, with uh, applying GA of this variety and other varieties, not only Payet's uh, prospects and Dakotas, timing is very important. So there is a difference. The same 13 parts per meter of this variety on Payette or in Prospect. If you apply when you're cutting the seed, so you cut, heal the seed for one or eventually two weeks, the effect of the gibberellic acid is, is much better than if you treat in furrow. So there's some growers, and I used to do that in the past as well. There are growers that uh, you have the, the infero kit application that you put your admire, your hectara, or whatever it is, you know, the, your, your insecticide, your fungicide, your quadris there, and you add gibberellic acid there. Because it doesn't cost almost anything, right? It's uh, 13 part, parts per million. You pull. It doesn't matter if, you, if you're buying the, 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 the dust or the, or the tablet. Or even the liquid is the, the, the cost of application of the gibberellic cast is minimum. So uh, you put in there. Uh, actually, you don't put in the tank. You dilute first, and after that, you you, you get your your solution there, diluted there, right? So it's but at the uh, in application in furrow is not as effective as during your seed cutting process two weeks in advance when you pre-cut. Okay. Um, this is this is one thing. The second thing that I want to mention is that uh, uh, it seems like uh, um, cut seed versus whole seed, actually cut seed absorbs better the, the gibberellic acid than whole seed. So that's another difference that you need to be aware of as well. Okay? So don't expect, hey, but Newton showed me that they will get 70% of all the pens. This is the situation that I had. So if you do, if you change the situation and you put in furrow, uh, probably the effectiveness will not be the same, or the impact on the number of tubers and stems will not be the same. So timing is important, and the type of seed that you're using is important, and the variety, as you can see, some varieties, they don't care or they don't get affected by, by uh, on the yield, especially because prospect gets a lot of, a, normally tends to get a formation of not so many tubers, but big tubers, um, and, uh, and payettes. Uh, Payettes has a low number of tubers, but in this case, specifically that I had last year, it was affected, so I had a reduction on the, on the yields. Okay. Yeah, Is there any difference in the length of time that the pre-cut seed is stored after it's been treated with gibberellic acid? I haven't seen any difference uh, between one and two weeks at all, uh, Lorraine. Uh, I haven't stored in those trials more than that. I, I didn't have to do that. Um, but I haven't seen uh, one, you need at least, I would say that you need at least one, between one and two weeks to get that uh, full impact because the, the, the because it's liquid application. So I believe that the wound area, so the open area, when you cut, that has a good absorption of the, the, the gibberellic acid, apparently. That's my guess. What if you cut, treat, and hold the seed for maybe a couple of days? Uh, I believe that what's what's going to happen is that uh, the uh, the tuber will be starting will be still absorbing that and processing that. I mean, the tuber is a live, live organism, so that will start to start to kind of distribute to different areas of the tuber to increase the concentration of the gibberellic acid. And when that happens and the reach the eyes, when the concentration of the gibberellic acid and the eyes start to increase. That's the time that you have an induction of the sprouting, right? Process. Which so, could after sorry. Which could happen after the seeds planted. Uh, yes, in, in your example of two days. Yes, yes. Is that Newton? Over ten minutes. Sure. Yep. Uh, next one. Okay. And this is part of the, the seed size. Uh, lots of you guys have uh, mentioned about that, uh, asked about uh, what happens if we plant the small seeds or big seeds or what is the right size of the seed uh, that they should have cut because uh, 
planting season is coming. So basically, we have done two years in a row um, um, using different varieties to try to understand that. Okay. So those are the main varieties that we have right now, especially the kind of the new ones that we're bringing. And even Burbanks, we have done some work on that. Okay. So uh, to understand this, and all the varieties do follow the same pattern. Okay. On the on the on the graphics here. So we have basically one and a half ounces whole seed, one and a half ounces cut seed, barrel cut. So the one and a half ounces cut seed came from a three ounces seed that was cut in half. The barrel cut seed was probably one, uh, possibly a six ounce seed that was cut to the uh, mimicking the cutter, the seed cutter that you have the that cut in the middle. That is, that's the one that we call the barrel cut. So it was a bigger seed piece. And the same rationale works for the other treatments here. So the, all the one and a half ounce seeds I have painted with this kind of a cream color. The, the green <coughs> ones are here on two and a half ounces and the three and a half ounces are in blue. So um, we try to understand exactly, and this is the triumph for 2021, if there's an impact or gain when you start to use uh, larger seed pieces, okay? And uh, here in the graphic, that I try to demonstrate that. So the, the column in blue is the total yield. The column in red is the pay yield. And these are the numbers. This is 100 weight per acre. And this line in green is basically the payout money here. And the, 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 the scale is here on the, right, on the right side of the graphic. Okay. And all the graphics <coughs> are the same. So the quarter rested, we got a big response, a significant response, if you use, if you use larger seed pieces compared to the uh, smaller seed pieces, okay? That's, so overall, definitely for the quarter rested, we would be recommending you to use larger seed pieces. It's a variety that has, if you see the tubers, they have a less number of, of uh, eyes on it, that automatically will translate in, if you cut small pieces, you get probably a lot of blind seed pieces, which you don't want, right? So, bottom line of the recorders, we're recommending to migrate, to move to, towards uh, uh, bigger seed pieces, and you get the response. Um, the economic analysis, I will have that, I have a table at the end, but it's, it's simple, right? It's, 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 uh, it's, it's uh, how much, how many bags you get, versus how many, how much more seed, how many bags of seed, extra seed that you need to plant per acre. And I have a calculation, you probably have a table in your, in, at home as well, but I have a, I have a, a table to, that can help to calculate that, the, the benefit, if it, it's worthwhile to, to make that move or not. This basically was the, the a picture of the, that was a couple, a few days ago. Uh, so this is the, sorry, this is the, uh, Hole, cut, and barrel, and so on. Hole, cut, and barrel, hole, cut, and barrel. Mountain jam, different story. And, well, things that, well, the yields normally are better, but when you see the three categories of, here, of, uh, of seed here on the size, seed size, I'll focus basically here, is that, uh, well, you don't get actually much of a response. You still get uh, some response when you go, migrate to three and a half ounces. But this is a variety that actually does, doesn't require, so probably somewhere around two, two and a half ounces, you probably will get the, the optimal response. This variety is a, has multiple eyes in, in, uh, in, in the tuber, so that ha actually facilitates, and even with not requiring large seed pieces, you can get good performance <laughs> in the field. Kind of quick uh, snapshot of the, the, the plot, how it was in the field. Prospect. Prospect is even even more interesting because um, it seems like there's not much effect on, on prospect. Um, on the other hand, prospect doesn't have many eyes either, right? As 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 as, 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 as the quarter, but uh, it didn't make much difference actually uh, if you move from one and a half to two and a half and the and the three and a half houses. But we do know that actually um, we we start to have uh, other products or other varieties and we start to see different behavior. So this is kind of snapshot of a recorder. Because look at Burbank. 
you probably should know about this because you have been growing burr banks for a long time, right? But this is basically what happened. So I know, but I know that in the past a lot of growers were kind of the between one and a half and two. Uh, but this is a variety that actually responded. You're talking about 2021. That was a good year, right? Good crop season. So we saw the response for that. So 351 to 400 bags. You normally don't see much of that in, in, on Burbanks here on the island, right? So Burbank is a variety that responds. This is how Burbank was looking like in the field. Tarhi, very similar to mountain jams, right? Uh, it's a variety that has multiple eyes. Uh, the, it doesn't have a huge set, but has good number of eyes as well, and probably in the, somewhere around the two and a half ounces um, would be the point, um, uh, the optimal uh, seed, seed piece size. Kind of a snapshot. And this was last year, so we had two new varieties, Alverstone and the uh, Altias. Anyone had a chance to, to work of Alverstones or Altias this uh, last, last season? Not yet? You? Perfect. So here's Alverstone. Alverstone, we start to see some, some kind of interesting behavior because we got a got good crop season in 2022, at least in Central, where the trial was executed. And uh, you see a response, not exactly linear, but you see a good response. 327 to 387. Not only that, if you pay attention to those numbers here too, total and pay yield, you start to see differentiation between the treatments. Same size. Whole, better than single, better than barrel. Whole, better than single, better than barrel. Whole, better than single and barrel. On that specific variety. Okay? So that's a variety that you can use probably uh, uh, larger seed pieces and use, you will get a response. That's the message that we're trying to get. Um, Altea, different story. Or you probably should be probably good in the, on the, around the two, two and a half ounces. But interesting that it kind of follows what we saw in Alverston. Whole better than single, better than barrel, whole better than single than barrel, and so on. <coughs> this is the table I was talking about. Okay, so basically to calculate how, but should I migrate, move to three and a half ounces? Should I stay with two and a half ounces, or can I plant the one and a half ounces? This is a simple table that you have this the, the spacing between plants here, six, seven, up to twelve inches. It can, it could go further than that. This is the plant population that is your target that you get per acre, and this is how many bags per acre you'll be using of seed. So basically, roughly, and I have three situations here, seed at 30 inches, seed at 36 inches, commercial crops probably 36 inches, most of your cases, there's some growers that are moving to 34. Um, so in an example, 12 inches, for example. 12 inches, you, you plant 14, uh, bags per acre, if you use one and a half ounce uh, seed pieces, uh, you need to, to get 20, you'll be using 20, 23 uh, if you move to 20, uh, 2.5 ounces, and you move to 32, uh, you need to plant 20, uh, use 20, 32 pound, uh, bags of uh, seed if you decide to cut your seeds at three and a half ounces as a target. So it's roughly nine to 10 bags extra for every one ounce that you move up. Of course, that if you move from two and a half to three, it's only half an ounce, so probably roughly you'll be talking about four or five bags per acre extra that you'll be using, okay? To basically pay, uh, to get the payback. And of course, not only the payback, it needs to be attractive to, to bring you more money. Uh, the seed cutting process, I will skip this, uh, the, the process per se, because I want to share this here which is one of the questions that, uh, multiple questions that I had last year, is, uh, well, we'll be cutting seed. When, when should I cut the seed? Uh, can I cut and plant, or should I pre-cut, store, treat, store, and uh, wait uh, before I plant? So I have done trials 2021 and 2022, and this, uh, this is what I want to share with you quickly, is this, uh, at the end of the day, Mountain Jams, two years in a row, is showing me, don't cut and plant. Pre-cut, store, treat, store, make sure that the, the, it's healed, and after you let you plant. 
So you have in 2201, fresh cut, it's the same rationale, the color coding, you already know, red is worst, uh, um, uh, green is good, and uh, if it's not color, it's basically they, they were the same, okay? So 2021, impact on total yield, pay yield, the total payout. 2022, same thing, fresh cut, negative impact on total payout, uh, total pay yield and payout as well. So don't plant fresh. So here we didn't have much of, much of a difference on that, um, but there's a trend that uh, pre-cut is kind of uh, overall better than financially and uh, yield-wise. I was not able to find significant difference, but there is a, I could see a kind of a trend on numbers. I may have to do that again. The Cotero Asset, Burbanks, and Prospect that they have done last year, uh, in 2021, I couldn't see, I couldn't notice a difference between them in 2021. Uh, so, if you have a, if you have to choose something that you don't have time or space to pre-cut, this variety eventually could be a possibility, okay? Because the other varieties that I have tested, and that was this last year, Alverston and Altia, both of them, fresh cut, did have a negative impact. Okay, so I would recommend Altias and our overstones to be planted pre-cut seed. Thing. Okay, I know that we have some growers that have planted a overstone fresh and didn't have problems. I know that I'm aware of all that because they I, they're looking very close to our research center that have planted uh, a couple years ago fresh because he didn't have time to to, to get it cut uh, pre-cut. But uh, based on what we have seen in this trial, there is a risk if you get overstones and Altias planted fresh. And even this was before that stress that we had in end of May. You guys probably remember that end of May we had a high a heat kind of a pocket. And after that we got uh, rain. So and then some of some of some of the growers that were planting that window uh, last few days of May, beginning of June, they had issues with uh, emergence because the seed was rotten. So this was planted before that, and still we found issues or a significant difference. That's the reason I feel more confident to say, hey, probably better to not plant fresh any of these varieties. Okay.